never teach because I always swore, oh, I'm never teaching those hormones and the drama. And actually, to be honest, they're my favorite age level. Um, but serious props to those of you who teach the littles. Because <laughs> after experiencing that, um, it was eye-opening. We'll put it that way. But I had so much fun with them. And um, it was a great experience to be able to teach the little ones. So other than that, being a math teacher for Kona Norco, I am also a professor for National Uni University. And I teach several courses for National University. I teach the master's program in instru instructional technology. I'm also a professor for the teacher credential program. So if you're um, got your teacher credential through National or you know someone who wants to, um, most likely you probably took one of my courses. Um, I'm also a student teacher supervisor for the university. So I go out into the field and I observe our student teachers, which now we have switched over to a virtual type situation, which is a, a learning curve all in its own there. And then I am also a um, teacher for the student teacher program as well. And then just to top it all off because, you know, I'm bored. Um, I also work for Riverside County Office of Education as an induction coach for secondary math teachers. So your first couple years as being a teacher, you get a coach and that would be me. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Here's some contact information. I am on Twitter. You guys are more than welcome to follow me. I post only professional stuff on Twitter, so you can get lots of cool ideas of things I'm doing with my teachers in my district or um, presentations I'm giving all around the world. And here is my personal Gmail. I prefer this one over my school email for you guys to contact me if you have any questions, just because my school email does get kind of bogged down with lots of um, emails. So I can, you know, keep it separate and be able to um, answer any questions that you have after this presentation. So one of the things I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to kind of go through it quickly because I want to spend more time on this particular lesson on standards-based grading versus the math stations. And the reason why is because tomorrow I'm doing a whole session just on math stations. So this is like a preview to the coming attraction. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit about math stations and how it literally saved my life uh, as a math teacher. And I wish I had done it sooner, but I was always a naysayer when it came to stations. I was like, oh my gosh, that's so much work. I'm not doing that. Forget that. And then I attended Google Camp one time <laughs> and I sat in a math stations um, you know, lesson conference and I was sitting there listening and, and it, like I said, I went in kind of rigid, like, oh, you know, what are they going to tell me that's going to make me want to do this? And I walked out with so much written down that I was like, I have to do this. I have to at least try this. And that's part of learning. You know, we learn through failures and you're going to fail and you're going to see things that bombed out and it's okay. And the first thing I did, especially with middle schoolers, is I told them, hey, look, I'm trying something new. I'm trying to make this a little bit more engaging. I'm trying to make this a little bit more fun. So you're not coming to math class every day going, all right, she's going to stand up there and teach and I'm going to learn. And this is so exciting. Um, I wanted it to be more exploratory, more collaborative and fun. Okay. Now, let me also preface by saying that even before COVID, I had 42 kids in each class. I had to teach about six periods a day. So I have a lot of students and I wanted to be able to reach them all individually for their learning needs. So through this presentation and into tomorrow's, I'll go in a little bit more in depth. I'm going to show you how I was able to individualize lessons for students who needed intervention and for those high students who needed enrichment. So I'm going to start off here with how do you reach all those learners? Really? How do you grade them? Okay. And so that's kind of the combination of this conference is to let you walk away with wrapping your head around how can I set this up in my own classroom and what is standards-based grading. Now, if you already use it, then you're going to be kind of just hearing it again. But if this is your first time 
hearing about standards-based grading or you've heard about it and now you kind of want to investigate in on it, hopefully I give you some tips and tricks that you guys can use. So let's get going. So again, how do you achieve the ability to meet all learners every day? Okay, and I know every principal out there wants you to make individual plans for every kid and you're thinking, I got 42 kids in a class that I teach for 45 minutes. That's not going to happen. That's a lot of prep work. Well, through the use of technology, um, you can do that. And like I was saying before, before COVID, when I did my math stations, even though I saw those students every day face to face, about 98% of my class was already online. So when we switched over to distance learning, my students were texting me going, do we just keep going? I'm like, yeah, keep going. They already had the setup. They already had it going. So they got so used to seeing things in the virtual world that it didn't even put a bump in their step. Now, some of them checked out and that's a whole different issue. <laughs> some of them took early summer. Um, but needless to say, the math stations literally saved me from insanity because I was trying so hard to bring those bottom friends up and help them who have been missing math skills for so many years. And at the same time, not boring my high students. So when we teach to the middle, we lose two thirds of our class because we have some that are lower and we have some that are much higher. And by creating these math stations, I was able to individualize these lessons for every student, but through the use of technology with that added support. Okay, so it, there's only one of me. So basically I had to make, you know, the computer help be me in their world. And so I'll show you all that too. And the best part about this, the kids never knew they got something different. I did this for many years and I never even had a student go, Miss Guyford, why does she have a different assignment than me? They really didn't know. I mean, my super high friends kind of figured it out at some point. They were like, why is it taking us longer to get this assignment done than it did that, that group. And you say you have those common, you know, you have those conversations and I say, hey, because I saw that I could challenge you. So yeah, I'm slowing you down. Yes, I'm making you think. Where things always came so easy to them because we taught right to the middle that those high students is flew through it and then they were done and they were bored and typically they were your problem students because they would act out because they're tired and bored. But I slowed them down real fast by giving them something that was a little bit more challenging. So to get started, I know everybody always goes, okay, well, how do I even wrap my head around this? How do I get started? So the first thing I always do is I do a pre-assessment. You know, and even in our credential program, I know a lot of times we heard pre-assess, pre-assess, and then we got into the real world and we're like, yeah, I don't have time for that. <laughs> so I am telling you, you got to make the time. And the pre-assessment, I'm not making them. They're not anything I'm making. I am using quizzes. A lot of times I can find a quiz on quizzes that is already made. And if it's not, I can make it real quick. The kids love quizzes because it can be um, competitive. They can work together to, um, you know, you know, challenge each other by getting a higher score. If you've ever played quizzes, it's great. Or I can turn that feature off if I don't want to intimidate anybody. Uh, sometimes I'll turn it off while they're doing the quiz and then at the end show the leaderboard and, you know, they don't care. But the whole purpose behind the pre-assessment is it's nothing that they have ever seen before. I have not introduced this lesson. I have not talked about the next unit. I haven't even said the title of the next unit. They're literally walking into the computer lab cold. All right, now let's flip flop to remote learning, which I know a lot of our districts are doing. Quizzes is online. So I would push out the quizzes and I would say you have until tonight to take this pre-assessment and give them the whole day to take it. I would turn off, obviously, the leaderboard at that point. And I am just looking at the data. I wanna see that not knowing any of this material, how many of the questions were you able to answer correctly? And I would keep it multiple choice. And I was just looking at, I'm not looking at speed, I'm looking at correct answers. If they got it wrong, then that tells me they've never seen this before. 
Now, as far as grading pre-assessments, I didn't. It was an effort grade. It was a citizenship grade. And it would still go in the grade book because a lot of times the kids, if it's not in the grade book, it doesn't count. Um, and then they would just kind of flake on it. But even putting it in the grade book and putting it under citizenship, a lot of times they didn't even realize I put it down as a citizenship grade. They just saw it in there. And so therefore it was counting for their grade. But I only gave it a score of one anyways. Um, grouping. After I take the pre-assessment, I would look at my data and I would find my top six, my couple middle six groups, and then my bottom six. I never made a group larger than six. Do they have to be six? No. I had groups of four. My top students were about four to five sometimes in a period. And they got really used to kind of seeing each other. But here's the beauty behind all this. Is the next unit, they may not be in the high group. They may be in the middle group, or my goodness, they might even be in the lower group because they've never seen this material before. So they never realized what group they were in. It, it never became that stigma of, oh, we're in the high group. Because every unit, it changed. Every unit, we pre-assessed. And so they got mixed up. They were forced to work with other people. And I had students who would score super high on one unit like knock it out of the ballpark for the pre-assessment. And they got in my high group, they were able to handle the challenge work, they were able to get all their work in, great. Here comes the next unit, let's say for instance, that was an algebra, now here comes a geometry unit and they're like, mm, I don't do geometry very well. And so now they're in my lower group. So they never really knew, okay? And you can you know, color code your groups, you can call it blue group, red group, green group, um, one, two, three, four, five, whatever you want to do. But I always told the kids, I group you by random. I would just tell them that. And they were always like, wow, okay. So they never really kind of caught on. Now, after I get them grouped, then I start to look at lessons that will help push them up. So when I looked at the pre-assessment, my questions were put in the pre-assessment by the standard. So say questions one and five were about the same standard. So if they missed questions one and five, they were put into a group with other students who missed questions one and five. And so when they went through their stations, some of their work was hitting hard on those two standards. I'm not teaching all the standards if they know it, I'm teaching what they don't know and I'm reinforcing that. Now, again, if they didn't miss anything on the pre-assessment or they missed one thing, well, then I'm giving them material of a bump up. Let's say I'm teaching eighth grade. I'm looking at this standard at the ninth grade level now. Where does this standard lead them going into integrated one? And then I would work around that. So that's developing my lessons. And it does sound like a lot of work, but once you kind of get into a routine, you get real used to where to grab resources from. I very rarely made resources, to be honest. I would, you know, borrow from Robert Komplinski's site. I would grab stuff from Open Middle. I'd grab stuff from Go Formative. I'd grab stuff from here and I would integrate it. So my students got real used to seeing these third party, um, you know, lessons. Now, here's a little drawing by my, um, you know, mentor. Caitlin Tucker. She has a book out all on math stations. And um, this is how she set up her in her brain how she wanted it to go. You have a teacher led station. That's something I would definitely keep even with remote learning that they have a day that they have to meet with you. Okay, and it could be through zoom. It could be through um, an interactive ed puzzle. Okay, but you need to be present for every single group. So even my high students met with me and guess what? We weren't doing the same worksheet I met with my, my lower friends on uh, the day prior. We're working on a worksheet that's a lot more challenging and I'm really getting them those questions and I'm making them explore, um, doing that higher rigor, higher DOK with them. My middle group, it was support and push, okay? Then you have your online stations and then you have some offline stations. Now, this is in a classroom scenario. So now going to remote learning, you're going to have a lot more online stations. So you have a teacher warm-up. So after the kids have taken the pre-assessment, like I said, I would give a teacher-directed lesson. So I would get up and teach the umbrella standard. 
Because as you know, we have the big standard and then we have substandards that things break down into and you can kind of break apart the standard. But I would teach the umbrella. I would teach the overall concept to the whole class direct instruction, okay? The kind of boring day. Um, and the kids would just take notes or they would do a couple practice problems. Um, give a shout out to my buddy, Ed Campos. I have 360 classroom, which means I have whiteboards all the way around my room. And so I would tell the kids, okay, I'm gonna do a couple problems. And now get up and I'm gonna put a problem on the board and I'm gonna walk around and see how much of it you heard. I'm gonna see how you're learning. And I could stand right in the center of the room and kind of look around and go, okay, he's getting it, he's getting it. I'm gonna go work with her. Um, things like that, okay? So you wanna do some sort of warm up where you're front loading the vocabulary and the skills that need to be completed at each station when they get there. Um, this is actually a picture of my class. Um, this is them working on um, an assignment together. This was the teacher station. So I am walking around monitoring the station. Um, we have these cool desks where the kids can take an expo marker right on it and an erases. So it's like a whiteboard. And then they would fill out the um, worksheet at hand and I would go around and give that instant feedback to them. I usually try to meet with my lower friends first because if I don't meet with them, as they rotate through the stations, they're gonna make lots of errors. Now, I don't always, because again, I don't want them to get that stigma of, oh man, we always meet with her first. We must be the low group. You wanna change it up, keep it different. Um, and sometimes I'd make them last. If I, if I knew I could get around to the stations while my station was working, so as you see, these kids are working independently. I gave them a, a problem. I would go around and write on their desks and give them examples, ask them prompted questions, and then I'd walk away. And I'd go check on my other stations just as a classroom management strategy as well. But that immediate feedback is really key because in a traditional setting, the kids would do a problem that the teacher's explaining and then turn it in and not know until about two, three days later if they even got it right. Collaborative assignments, um, having them work together. You'll see them up out of their seats. They're talking, they're moving around. Um, right behind my students here, you can see my whiteboards in the room. They would get up, they'd write on the whiteboards. They would um, try and tackle this problem together and it was an all buy-in. And how did I make sure every student was bought in? That classroom management, just walking around and going, hey, have, has anyone, if I saw a student not working, I would say, has anyone asked? Johnny here what he thinks and then Johnny's kind of put on the spot he's like um I don't really have anything oh well then you know what I need you to start participating in the you know the collaboration here so you do know what's going on so kind of gets that accountability going then I would have a project-based lesson and this was something I would gear for all of my students all levels they would all get the same project this was one I didn't differentiate. Everybody got the same project and it was geared at a DOK three or four. So this was tough. This was something that really tuned into those higher order thinking skills for those learners. So again, everybody got this, but the secret mission here, and I would always deliver it like a classified file, is they couldn't tell the answer. If they got it, they could not tell the answer to the other groups. And so a lot of times these groups would work off to the corner, they would be whispering, they're all close together, but they had their buddy system there. And I always told the kids, if you don't get the answer, get as far as you can. Because yeah, a DOK4, it can be very hard, even for educators. So I would say, dude, I just wanna see how far you can get. And then of course, there's a collaborative technology. This is when I would use like a breakout or I would use a quizzes where they would, you know, challenge each other. I would use, um, you know, hyperdocs, all kinds of stuff or hyperslides. Um, and this was a really a great way for them to get that self-assessment if they're really getting this. Then at the end, before I give a exam or an assessment of some sort. We always had a technology review. All right, so what do I do after they've done all their sessions? I would have a catch-up day because you're always gonna have kids who were absent that need to finish their work. I would um, put them in a small table, let them finish up. 
The kids who were finished with all their assessments, they're now working on the study guide with a peer. And then I always had the answer key for the study guide up at the front of the room and they could walk up and check. And it was so funny to hear them come up and go, see, I told you, to, you know, just hearing that collaboration. And the kids got so used to, instead of showing their work on the, the study guide, because sometimes there's not enough room, they get up and write it on the whiteboard to show each other. And it was great. They could also work on redoing any of their stations if they wanted to get a higher score. They could do an error analysis assignment where I would give them an error on the work and they had to then change it up and fix it. And then I'd assess. Now an assessment at this point is a summative assessment. Everything else prior to this was formative, okay? You're gonna hear me use those words in the standards-based grading section here coming up real soon. So my quizzes and my final exams were always considered a summative assessment where it held a little bit more weight because now I'm looking for that mastery. Everything prior to this is practice. It's learning, okay? All right. I'd reevaluate the data and I take it from there. All right, I would compare it with the pre-assessment scores. I wanted to see that growth. And the kids like to see that growth too. They're like, wow, I scored really bad on that pre-assessment, but now I've scored really high on this quiz. I'm like, yeah, do you see that doing these different types of learning activities um, at the stations, you raised your score. Now again, that was pretty fast for math stations, but I am presenting this again tomorrow if you want, uh, with more slides, of course, um, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about that. So now let's talk about standards-based grading. All right, it is a shift, okay? It is a mind shift. Um, and again, this one I was kind of a naysayer on too because I was so traditional, you know, 20 years in the, in the field and my mom was an educator. Um, so I've grown up in the schoolhouse. And I've grown up with traditional grading, you know, um, A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's, okay? Um, I think I said E there. <laughs> but I grew up with that same scale, and I taught with that scale, and I felt that if they had this, they should be doing this. And then I started to listen to people about standards-based grading. And a shout out to my friend, Miss Byers at Roosevelt. She really turned it around for me. She did a presentation in a, in a book club that I joined in on where we all read a book and we discussed um, what we were reading about standards-based grading. And it started to make sense. And now as a mom with a kid in the district, um, and I see that traditional scale come, I'm like, oh, I wish they were doing standards-based grading. But... We're going, we're getting there. Hopefully um, this will, you know, make it through the system somehow and we can see this evolve. So it is a difficult road, but roads lead to beautiful destinations. You're gonna finally see that what they are earning in your class is their true academic ability, okay? It's not a skewed image of their academic ability. So let's talk a little bit about the integrity behind the grade. So when we talk about that shift, you are no longer looking at certain things, okay? So before, your grade could reflect behavior, quantity, journeys, um, individual preference, short-term compliance, teacher involvement, and arbitrary assignments, all right? So your grade at that time could be there. Now, we do want to take that and bring it over to the shift, bring it over to the standards-based grading, where behavior now lends to learning. Quantity now revolves to quality. The journey is more of the destination. Where are they going to take this? Where is it going to lead them down the road? Individual preference becomes a common agreement, and that's where that collaboration comes in, where we all understand this is the standard, what do we need to know about it? It's not just, all right, the teacher wants us to learn this. It's no longer a short-term compliance where they're just doing it for your 45-minute class, that it becomes a long-term retention. It makes sense to them. They've connected it to their world. Teacher involvement now becomes, hey, student involvement. Again, this is why it works so well with math stations is it's off me and on them. And I'm running one station, but I'm also just walking around answering quick questions. But they're doing their learning and their explorations at their table. 
And then you have things from arbitrary assignments because, oh, my partner teacher is given this worksheet. I guess I have to too. And you may have buy-in on the worksheet. You may really love it or you may really even hate it, but you're still giving it. That's arbitrary. Okay, let's turn it into an authentic experience. All right, connecting that real world. So how does standard space learning cycle work? Okay, first of all, it never ends. It is a true cycle. So you have your teaching. This is where the teacher focuses on the instruction on the standards. Okay, and these are, if standards have not been met yet, we can come back to this, all right, at the end. So again, this is where that, you know, pre-assessment came in. This is where the, my direct instruction of the umbrella came in and I would just kind of go from there. And then st students learn skills to meet the standards. That's your stations, all right? You're giving them skills. Now, if you don't wanna do stations, that's totally fine, but you can still give them different types of practice that will help them look at that standard in different ways, all right? If they're always looking at, at it laid out, especially with math, in an arithmetic form or an algorithm form, that's all they're ever gonna learn about that standard. You need to connect it to their world. How is this relevant? Who uses this kind of math? And get them to develop those projects and those collaborations. And then you have your assessments and this is where students complete tasks to assess that they've met the needs. That's where you're looking for your mastery. Okay, and that's where all of this ties in. Now, if they assess and they're still not doing well, the cycle starts back over again, okay? Which is also the beauty of having stations is you can give that, you know, differentiation to those students again, like it's almost like a spiral, you know, learning process and they don't even know, all right? So they're, they're still going through the stations but they don't realize they're getting anything different than the group who was there the day before, all right? But if the student does show mastery, then they move on and we keep on going. And it really becomes almost a self-paced type classroom at the same time. So the main goal here is that students progress toward meeting those standards by the end of the year. And I would find, to be honest, because we have a lot of standards. And I even tell this to my student teachers, oh my goodness, have you looked at the standard book? They said Common Core was supposed to lessen standards, not so much. So I print out and I actually have a template of all the eighth grade standards and I go through and highlight the must-haves. Must have this, okay? They have to learn the standard in order to progress to high school. Now I go through and I check those off. Those are the standards I work on all year. If I have time, I can embed those softer standards, okay, the support standards. But if I teach, if I do my job well and I teach to those core standards, those soft standards are in there anyways. So I'm not gonna take extra time or extra pacing days to talk about a standard that they're only gonna work with or manipulate once or twice or baby this. If you wanna say we teach to the SBAC or to the test, there's two questions about it. Why? That's not worth your time. If you work on those core, you're gonna have more time and you're gonna have more ability to give that intervention and spiral review. So standards-based grading involves measuring students' proficiency and it's well-determined by course objectives. So I'm gonna let you look here. There's a side here all on traditional grading and a side here on standards-based grading. So I highlighted some key terms here, all right? So with traditional, you get a grade given per assessment, okay? In standards-based grading, you're giving a grade per learning goal. The goal is to learn how to do adding fractions with unlike denominators. Can the kid do that? There's their grade. It's not this convoluted one-size-fits-all assignment. All right, you break it down, and that's part of the breaking down the standard part. So you can assess, and I'm going to show you what that looks like as far as the grade book is set up. Traditional, you're looking at a percentage system. 90% is an A minus, 85 is a B. All right, with standards based, you're looking at proficiency proficiency based. Did they meet the standard? 
have they mastered the standard not met the standard okay you're using those terms in fact side note when i grade students papers i don't put the points or the abc or anything like that what i put is met or i put exceeds or i put not met and then i put the word yet and the kids don't really know well, did i get an a or a b you met the standard i'm good let's keep going and the kids will come up to me and go well can i redo it so i can get an exceeds of course because they're learning and any kid who wants to redo their work to learn more let them okay um with traditional you're looking at a mixed assessment i'm just gonna check my time okay mixed assessment effort and behavior if a kid misses an assignment we're counting it as a zero not with standards base that's a behavior a zero in standards base meant there's no evidence of any sort of mastery okay so now let's kind of go in to points versus base system okay points is you know your typical classroom 10 out of 10 is an a all right standards base if a kid technically receives a 10 out of 10 if you grade it and that's what you would have given them there exceeds okay and now you have to look at how you're going to set up your percentage scales so again we're going to talk about unpacking that standard here kind of gives you a visual of what i was talking about you have this umbrella standard you break it down and there's your three things you want to work on or four things most standards are break down into three to four components if it breaks down into more it technically should be two separate standards okay so when i'm doing this with my student teachers in the credential program or the ones i go out and observe i always tell them you're you're teaching too much at once you really need to break this down even further teach that one set of evidence first and then assess on that okay so that's kind of how you want to wrap your head around unpacking that standard it'll look something similar to this with the standards base portion behind it is if they can do let's say those four things now on this particular image there's six um if they can master all of that that is a mastery so they're showing mastery at those two standards that are listed below the behavior was the engagement piece now look at the engagement piece did they turn in their assignments? Did they arrive to class on time? Did they contribute to their group? Did, was their technology appropriate? Blah, blah, blah. Those are behaviors. That is not a grade for the grade book. That should not be counting as far as their A, B, C, D grade. That is citizenship, okay? So when you are looking at standards-based grading, you need to look at things that are a direct correlation, the targeted instruction, multiple attempts, again, allowing them to do redos um you can set deadlines okay so you can at one point say friend <laughs> i gotta move on um i don't want a kid redoing an assessment in may that i gave to them in september because to be honest at that point i think they are point chasing okay and you want to focus on understanding the material rather than it being a task so you have a little flow chart here. You learn the skill, you practice, they make mistakes. And this is something I show my students in class is you're going to go through this flow chart maybe a couple times during a unit and that's okay. You can retest, you can repeat, you can go back and there's no fear in failing. And I tell them all the time, if you fail or you get a not met yet, turn it around, come see me that's when we need to have a collaboration all right and here's just another person's flow chart that i thought was pretty um, useful as well it pretty much says the same sort of thing so formative assessments these are things that we're not grading my stations are citizenship grades all right it does go in the grade book they do get participation points for it but i'm not grading them because it's practice they haven't mastered it yet all right, you mean to tell me that I can give a, an instruction of a lesson and then the next day expect mastery? That's never gonna happen in any classroom. So as they practice and they go through the stations, they're gonna make mistakes and they're gonna fix it, but I want them to fix it. And I remind them that, yeah, it might not be counting towards your ABCD grade, but it is gonna be on the assessment. 
And when you get to that final or you get to that unit assessment, you want to see this again. And you're going to see it and go, oh, yeah, that's right. So here's just a reminder of what our traditional grading scale looks like. And look at the bottom, 0 to 59. That is a massive jump. Everything else is in categories of 10 until you get to the F. And all of a sudden, that zero is going to drop their grade so bad. And that's called the zero killer. It's just mathematically unethical, OK? That if a child turns in zero, their grade is dropping 58 points. That's crazy, all right? So they're never going to get out of the, the hole if they have two or three of those. So that child is struggling. Okay, so here's an, a penalty here where you have student A took a quiz, got 100. Their second one, they didn't take. They missed it. They were at the doctor's office, whatever. Um, they haven't made it up. Quiz three, they got a 75. And quiz four, they got an 80. They're averaging an 85 in the class right now, which would be standard met. Okay, or a, a B grade. But then you look at punishing them with that zero. Oh, you know what? You weren't here that day. You get a zero on that quiz. You haven't come to make it up. Now their grade has dropped to a 62. That's a D. Do you think that child deserves a D when they're busting out a 100, a 75, and an 80? Not at all, OK? Here's another just um, you know, visual as well. Look at number six. Number six has the zero. If you received a 98, a 98, a 99, and a 100 on unit tests, the summative, the final exam, would you give that kid a C because they had one zero? No. That child is 100% exceeds mastery. They should be getting an A plus in the class, not a 79. So what does the grade mean? You have different scales. Now I'm gonna show you different scales that people have used, and I know I'm running out of time here. Um, I only have a few more minutes, but pick the scale that works best for you. There are some people who do a, um, a four point scale and then throw in a couple halves in there. Um, some people look at it this way where they have a beginning, emerging, developing, proficient, and then advanced, where it correlates with the A, B, C, D, F range, so that way they're their shift isn't so dramatic for them. They can kind of make it a little bit more accessible. Some people break it down into four categories where you just have exceeds, mets, um, review, and then no evidence. Then you have other scales here. I mean, you guys are more than welcome with this, you know, bit.ly. Feel free to look back at these at any time. These are just examples I have found other people using. Here's one where they took the letter grade and they were able to switch it over to a four, three, two, one, zero scale for themselves. But again, notice at the bottom, their zero is still zero to 59. I would change that. All right, but this is just stuff that other people have used. All right, this kind of gives you an idea of the traditional scale to the letter grade for a one to five scale, and then also for a zero to four scale, depending on what you wanna use. Now notice the percentages. I went from a 90 to 100 for an A, but over here it's 80 to 100. If a student can produce 80% knowledge of that standard, they've exceeded. That's an exceed, okay? So you have to wrap your head around that as well. This is my actual grading scale that I use. I use the five as exceeds. 4 and 3.5 are met, um, or are at mastery. 3 is at met, and 2 and 1 are needing some help. Now, we talked about citizenship. This is my citizenship rubric that I use with my students, where, again, this is that work completion. This is the behavior. This is all that stuff. Um, you, if you want to email me, I'm more than happy to send you emails or links to any of these items that are on my deck that you want to, you know, just use in your classroom is totally fine. But this especially going to remote learning, using that device appropriately and participation. Here's what it looks like in a grade book. And I'm just going to kind of click through this. So you're no longer seeing, you know, 10 out of 10, 5 out of 5, whatever. You're seeing one, two, three, four. You're showing that level of mastery. One being they didn't get it, two that they did. And notice there's no zeros. 
Here's someone else's who had it um, color coded. If you ever take a um, training on ex um, Google Sheets or Excel, that's super easy. It's called a conditional formatting. This is um, how I set up my grade book. Mine kind of looks a little bit like this. <laughs> so you can see that I um, color coded it. I can see very quickly, wow, this kid down here has a red almost going all the way across. That is a student who I need to sit down with, okay? But I break it up into quarters, I break it up into units, and then at the end of the year, there's their long um, grid. So these are all templates that you can create. You can um, put in equations to have it do the math for you, which is always nice. Now, I even have an online grading system. We use Q for Crona and Orco, but I still like to keep my own spreadsheet that way. So you've come this far, not to only just come this far. All right, if I've kept your attention this long, then I'm pretty sure you're thinking, maybe I can do this. All right, so I'm out of time, but this is something I stole from another school district, and this is their presentation they give to their parents on standards-based grading. And it literally just goes through everything I just talked about, talks about how it's set up so the parents can learn and understand. And at the very end of my deck is the girl's email who made this slide. Um, and she's willing to take on questions and, and help as well. And same for me, she sets it up a little differently, but my point is you can set it up how you're comfortable. But um, definitely check out some resources. I want to show you real quick before I log off and take questions. Um, there it is. There's her information. These are some books. Okay, I am just finishing reading the standards based grading book, but I've read the other two. Amazing, mind blowing, where you're like, dang, I wish my teacher would have graded me like that back in the day. Um, great, great resources. They're all on Amazon. Um, you can get the Kindle versions for some of them. Highly recommend checking those out. And again, there's my information. You're more than welcome to email me or follow me on Twitter, tweet me a question. I'm always on. You can always ask me questions. Sorry, June, I went over. <laughs> no, you're fine, uh, but there are some questions in the chat if you okay. wanted to address those. Sure, I'm gonna go to stop sharing just for a second, just so I can see that. All right, um, let's see. How do you manage grading when students are already starting below grade level? Very good question, Becky. Um, one of the things I do is I have that learning goal for that student. So when I break down that standard and I break it into different evidence, I'm looking at what are they able to do with that standard? And then I throw in some spiral of where they're actually at. So they have two learning goals. So again, the kid doesn't really know that I'm grading them on stuff, they sh the prerequisite stuff, but I'm also grading them on stuff that's current. And it's all embedded. So when the kids get on and they're doing the assignment, they're actually doing two different learning goals at the same time. And I'm more than happy to share that with you in more in depth because I know it's probably like a really sad answer, <laughs> but um, it's easier if I have my visuals in front of me to show you. But I do, I have, I have kids who are operating at a third grade level and I teach eighth grade math. You know, um, at that point you're like, what do I do with this kid? I can't give him anything. Yes, you can. Okay. And it's all about how you embed that. So um, feel free to email me and we can set up a Zoom and we can chat more too. Uh, let me see. I would give two grades. You're right, Becky, I would. And the kid doesn't even know that I would give, and that's where that Excel spreadsheet comes in handy because it's not on the Q system where the parents can see all that I, what I put on Q is their mastery level at the very end. And until then, it's all set. And then um, Noah, Noah has a question. Noah, all right, Noah, where are you at? I think I need to scroll some more. Okay, does scoring 1.5 and 2.5, et cetera, help or does it make it easier? Okay, the only 0.5 I used was 3.5 and that's because five was exceeds for me. And then a four was still an A. That 3.5, I needed something in between that met and master because they're so close. It's kind of like your B. Um, but I know a lot of teachers who are like, uh, uh, I don't use any 0.5s. It's just straight up mathematically. It'll all work out. 
um, as long as you're consistent with your percentages or not your percentage, but your, your value that you assign to those numbers. So when I got to my one, uh, my one didn't go to zero. Now in my grading system at Coronarco, we have Q and if anybody uses Q, um, you have to have something at a zero. My zero was a zero. So if I gave a student a zero, that means they had zero evidence. I'm talking, they sat down, they answered one question, they gave up. Yeah, I, mine was more about the special ed EL. Oh, okay. Um, for the special ed EL kids, yes, I would, I would definitely probably use the 0.5s. No, not with the 0.5, not 0.5. That was a minor question. My big question was special ed and EL above. Okay, ask me again, just because my, my chat box is like super long. No, I just, I'm a special ed teacher, and so I just, this topic you mentioned in your thing about special ed and EL, I didn't really hear a lot of stories yeah. of special ed or EL. Well, thank you for bringing that up. I actually am a former special ed teacher. I taught special ed at the high school and the elementary level. And this helps with grading because they're not always going to be at the same level as the rest of the kids. And then they wind up getting a very modified assignment where it's really not even showing any mastery. But with my special ed students, even today, because now I'm a gen ed teacher, they still give me the special ed students because I can standards-based grade them. So when I break apart that goal and I look at those pieces of evidence, I look at what manipulatives can I give them? What support can I give them? And so when they go to the computer stations or they go to um, their rotations for their stations, and this will be kind of more into um, my assignment, my lecture tomorrow, but when they go, they're getting a specialized assignment for them. And doesn't mean I put all my special ed kids together because again, it's all by their pre-assessment and how they did on that pre-assessment. So if they're in my high group, they're in my high group. They're getting challenge work. They knew that stuff. And I've had my, some of my special ed students um, that excelled in math. And then I have some who are like, yeah, we're still working at the third grade level here. So when they got to their stations, I would try and work them out that way. So when I graded them, I would grade them based on that assignment and how well they did on that assignment. Does that kind of yeah, make sense? Well, Sorry. I know how to grade special. I mean, you're just yeah. talking a lot. I'm with specific lessons or stories that you've done in a group with special ed or EL, but I guess it's at the next one. This was all grading. I, 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 so my, yeah, so I know how to grade and, and I appreciate all your slides. Right. I just specifically what you, I'm the EL lead and a special ed teacher. Those right. are the kids I care about. How do they get implemented in groups with lessons? But I guess that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Yeah. I wish I had had a little right. bit more time because that is something I'm going to bring up is, is breaking them into the groups that's going to support them the most. Yeah. So I, I just need specifics. I don't need, you know, I need specific lessons right. and Google stuff. So. Right. Yeah. I'll share with you guys tomorrow um, some third party companies that I use that are free, which is always yeah. great, um, that you can, it gives great support. And how I use Screencastify to record myself teaching. And so they get me as a support as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more tomorrow. I'm sorry. I'll have to uh, close out the session now because we have another one coming on board. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining us. Bye, Jenny. Bye.